Hey, welcome to Park Notes. I'm Parker, and in this video, I'm going to give you three reasons why I think you should be writing in your books. I'll then help you develop your own philosophy of writing in books, and then I'll give you a practical application. I'm going to show you how I write in my books, how I take notes, the symbols I use, and hopefully that'll be beneficial to you. So make sure you watch till the end so you can see a practical application of how someone writes in their books. So let's jump right in. Notes that are taken in the margins of a book. Those are called marginalia. It's a super cool word. It looks really fancy. It sounds really fancy, but it's not. It just comes from margins. The word margin just comes from the word edge. So if you're into like plants, marginal plants are those that grow at the edge of the water towards the land. So marginalia are just notes that you take at the edge around the corners, around the words of the text of the book that you're reading. Now, way back in the day, people used to read from scrolls, which were written on papyrus, which is like a reed or like a celery type material. And so these things were pretty fragile. They were really expensive. They were really rare. They were hard to get. These things are not the type of thing that you would take marginalia in because they were so valuable. But then they invented the codex, which is the modern day book that opens up. And the codex started to replace scrolls in like 600 AD. Now your ancestors were probably not writing in their codexes because these were monographs. These were handwritten by someone who could read and write. So like the scroll, they were still really, really expensive. They were still hard to get. They still were expensive to produce. And so maybe a church had a library where you could go and read if you knew how to read. But most people were not owning books. But fast forward to 1436 and you have this goldsmith named Gutenberg. He invents the printing press, which mass produces books. And now fast forward all the way to today, you have lots and lots of books. I have tons of books. Your house probably has a bunch of books. So we don't have the same excuse that our ancestors had to not write in our books. Write in your books. But let me further motivate it. So the first reason I want to give for why I think you should write in your book is to help you understand the text that you're reading. Now, when you're pen in hand writing in the margins of the book that you're reading, you're practicing active reading. You're actually focused down, consciously aware of the words and the content being expressed by those words. I'm sure we're all familiar with the phenomena of having to read a single page like eight, nine, 10, 11 times over and still not knowing what the heck's going on. Why is that? It's because we're probably a little bit more passive while we're reading or we're distracted. Our mind is somewhere else. And even though our brain is going through the syntax of reading English sentences or whatever sentences you're reading, the content isn't there. The semantics don't come through because you're not focused on the text itself. You're not reading for content. You're not actively reading. But when you read with a pen in your hand, marking up the text, creating marginalia, taking little notes, you're better able to comprehend what you're reading. Now, some of you may be saying, why can't I just use my laptop? I'll just use my keyboard and take notes that way. I can take much more notes more quickly. Why can't I just do that? Well, there's actually some pretty good psychological research that says taking notes by hand is a better method of learning than taking notes by your computer. So one study that I will link in the description here is by Pam Mueller and Daniel Oppenheimer. The title is, The Pen is Mightier Than the Keyboard, Advantages of Longhand Over Laptop. Now in the abstract, they say, in three studies, we found that students who took notes on laptops performed worse on conceptual questions than students who took notes longhand. We show that whereas taking more notes can be beneficial, laptop note takers' tendency to transcribe lectures verbatim rather than processing information and reframing it in their own words is detrimental to learning. So even though taking notes by hand may be less efficient, it's actually more beneficial for comprehension. So if you're reading for comprehension, then you need to be doing so with a pen in your hand. You should take notes right there in the margins to promote active reading and to help you digest the content from the author. Okay, so the second reason I think you should be marking up your books, writing in them, creating marginalia, is for quote, harvesting. Now I'm not gonna say quote mining, because quote mining is like a pejorative term for a faux scholar who abstracts out quotes and then strings them together in a way that suits their arguments, but don't necessarily do justice to the authorial intent of the original author that they grabbed that quote from. I'm quote mining because I'm taking these out of context. I'm, I'm going to say quote harvesting because I think that you're planting the seeds the first time you go through and you're marking up, hey, quote this, memorize this, use this in your commonplace books or your compendiums. You're going to come back and you're going to harvest the quotes that you've done the hard work of bracketing out while you've been actively reading. So by marking up your text, you're making it easier for yourself to go back and find that special quote that you want to share with the person, that you want to share with yourself, that you want to use 
however you want to use it in a not quote miny you know egregious type way now i've made a video on the distinction between a compendium and a commonplace book so go check that out you can find that maybe linked up here you can find it in the description at least that's just a little distinction that i've made so go check out that video now the third reason i think you should be taking notes in your books is for future people including future you but also your future family and future biographers maybe the last one's kind of weird but just let me get to it so future you is going to have to read this book again because you can't master a book just one time you need to read it again and again and again so especially if you're doing like really hard conceptual work you need to mark this book up for yourself to leave breadcrumbs to make the second time around more easy for you the third time the fifth time but also you can track your intellectual history if you're writing in question marks hey i don't quite get what this author is saying here here's a question mark here's a note and here's the date maybe the next time you go back you go wow i i can't believe i didn't understand that i totally get that now here's the answer but maybe the third time you come back wow i, I actually didn't know that here's the real answer you leave dates. Now you have an intellectual history for yourself. So marking up your text makes it easier for you to read a second, third, fourth, tenth time. But it's also kind of a cool thing for your family members. Let's say you pass a book on to your kids that has a bunch of your marginalia in it. They can see what dad or mom thought while they were reading this portion of the book. That's actually a really sweet gift to give your kids. Maybe when you pass away, you leave your books to your family and they can see your thoughts. They can hear from dad or mom even after you're gone. Something to think about. But then thirdly, Hey, maybe you become famous and people want to write biographies about you. You're helping your future biographer. They don't have to guess. They don't have to fill in the blanks and some weird stuff. They don't have to make up a bunch of stuff about you. They know what you thought. They can read it in your marginalia. I had this cool experience when I was working on my master's of systematic theology. I was able to read C.S. Lewis's marginalia, his actual books. I was able to see his physical notes from his books over at the Wade Center in Wheaton, Illinois. They have a catalog system of all of his books and all the marginalia on each page of each book. So you can just go in and you search the book and you can see how much marginalia is there, how many notes did he take on which pages. And then if you have a good enough reason, you can request to see that book. The librarian goes and gets it. She's got her weird gloves on, brings it over to you, puts it on like a, a red pillow. It's kind of weird. It's kind of like a, a relic or something, but they, they bring it out. They take all your pens from you. They give you a pencil just in case your hand slips and you don't, you know, write in pen on the C.S. Lewis book. So you write in pencil or you can take notes on your laptop. But you can actually study C.S. Lewis's thoughts on the books that he owned. That's a pretty cool thing. So maybe that last one's a little bit arrogant, a little bit like conceited, thinking someone's going to write a biography about you. But just in case, if you take notes for other reasons, this is like an added benefit. Okay, so hopefully by now I've motivated the why for writing in your books. Why should I do it? I gave you the reasons. But how should you go about doing it? This, I think, is going to be person relative. I think it's going to depend on your reason for reading that particular book. I don't take the same notes in all my books. It depends on why I'm reading that book. So are you reading for research, uh, professional or academic? Are you reading for personal development? Are you reading to argue with the author? Maybe you already know their key thesis, you know the premises. You just want to take them to task. Are you reading for pleasure? Are you reading for a book club? There are lots of different reasons that we're going to be reading. And those reasons are going to determine the types of notes that we take in the margins. So figure out your why for reading any particular book, and that will help you know what kind of notes to be taking. If you're going to be doing a lot of quote harvesting, then you're going to be using a lot of brackets probably. You're going to maybe use like an eyeball where you put a dot and a circle around it. Hey, here it is. Check this out. Maybe you're going to be folding a lot of pages. I know that's going to be hard for a lot of people to hear to dog ear your pages. Mine are all sorts of chewed up. I love dog earring pages. So I actually don't have a lot for you here. You need to develop your own philosophy of how to take notes. Do some trial and error, but really figure out why you're reading that book. So maybe that's not that helpful for you, but I'm advocating a broad philosophy of marginalia for you for each particular book that you start reading. So I understand that's kind of high level. Let me get practical here and let me show you how I take notes in a couple books that I'm reading right now. Okay, so when it comes to actually taking the notes and symbols in your book, there are a lot of different symbols you can use. Here are some that have been recommended to me. A little alpha for interesting, uh, square root for well-argued, questionable, up upside down, I don't understand, upside down question mark, memorize this conclusion. When you see a conclusion of an argument, CF compared to similar to contra, just writing contra, that's against. DEF, definition, re is in reference to, regarding, eg, for example, argument, page. 
So these are some that have been recommended to me. The ones I really like are square root right there. I do a rec, just a regular question mark instead of that one. Memorize this is a really big one that I use for, I use that in brackets for quotes that I need to come back and harvest. Conclusion's really helpful. I like the three dots for conclusion, makes me feel smart. Contra is good. Um, I love DEF for definition. Uh, and those are really the ones that I use, but here's a full list for you guys. Boom. So let's check out some of the notes in the wild. Here's a book that I'm currently reading, Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans by Melanie Mitchell. Very, very good book. I recommend it for the history of AI and getting a good grip on what's going on nowadays. So here you can see uh, this passage is about Moore's Law, Gordon Moore. So I'm going to look at that. I want the date. I want the name. I'm going to give myself a little title to reference. So this is you know marginalia. When I'm scrolling through, where's Moore's Law? Oh, it's right here. There we go. Moore's Law highlighted and boxed. So I'm going to box his name. But I'm going to box the thing. that's. This is more important than that. Moore's Law. What is it? There it is. Highlighted and underlined. This secondary sentence is not as important, but that's going to draw my attention. And if I want to understand that, I better read the rest of it here. So you can see this is connectionism. This is the philosophy behind things like chat GPT. So that's really important for me to figure out right now. We have terms like back propagation, general learning al algorithm, distributed process. These are all like new key concepts for me to learn. Here's another important paragraph. I'm going to box that out because the whole thing's important. I'm going to highlight it. What's it about? Well, it's about human level AGI. What's AGI? Artificial general intelligence. Then I'm going to summarize it right here in order for me to quick glance. What do I think about this? Okay. Is it worth reading back over this paragraph? It really looks like it because I've done a lot of work there. Scrolling down, here's a passage that I need to either commit to memory or slip into the AI commonplace book. So let's just kind of scroll through and look at more fast pace. I'm not going to explain them all. Here's some more key terms. I'm going to box those and highlight them. So, so hopefully you can see that I'm trying to catch my own attention for the second, third, fifth time through. I help myself with quote harvesting. I'm helping myself understand in the moment, but I'm also leaving breadcrumbs for the second, third, fourth, fifth time that I'm coming back through in order to help me understand. This is Artificial Intelligence, a very short introduction by Margaret Bowden. She's awesome. I'd love to get her on my podcast. So, you know, fingers crossed here. This book I've already read through and I've left myself all sorts of breadcrumbs to help me for the third, fifth, eighth time reading back through. I will underline key names and this whole block is about Noam Chomsky. So that's important. So really, I'm just marking this up in order that next time I'll have an easier time reading it. So I'll take way more notes than I will for a book like Deep Work by Cal Newport. If you look in here, you know, I have some quotes. I have my business card. Some quotes that I like, I may use, but this isn't a research book. I'm not really going to be using this in any philosophical papers or theological papers. This is the second time I'm reading over this book. So I'll help myself. I'll leave some notes, but really this is personal study, so I don't take as diligent of notes. And it's not that hard to understand. It's not like the AI book. So then for just personal enjoyment, here's Dune going over this a second time. But Dune has a lot of really good proverbs in it. Frank Herbert, just a, a beast of a popular level philosopher, sage type dude. He makes up all these really great proverbs in a similar way that J.R.R. Tolkien will do in The Lord of the Rings. They just, they come up with these awesome gnomic statements and they dump them in their books. So here you're not going to see hardly any notes. You may see like some blocks uh, and that's for me to come back and quote harvest. So this is a book that I'll read before bed. I'm not going to be sitting at my desk, like actively reading as much. So you won't see a whole ton of notes in books like these because they're just for personal enjoyment. So books on artificial intelligence and, you know, the philosophy of mind books in my area of competence where I'm, I'm trying to be an expert in this. I'm going to be taking lots and lots of notes in the margins, lots of marginalia, trying to catch my attention, trying to remind myself of what's going on, trying to help me understand in the moment and Help me come back. So the more important it is to you, the more notes you're going to have to take. The more it's a rigorous academic book, I think the more notes that you should be taking. If it's your area of expertise, 
then you're going to really need to be taking lots and lots of notes. All right, so there you go. There are three reasons I think you should be writing your books. I gave you a little bit about how to develop your own philosophy of marginalia, and I'll give you some examples of me writing in my own books. I want to hear from you guys. Which reason do you think is best? W will you start writing in your books if you haven't before? Do you guys have better symbols than me? I would love to hear more symbols. Leave me a comment, leave me a like, and uh, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of these Park Note videos. I'll see you guys next time.